All right, boys. Let's get some Taco Bell. Call of Duty has always been a series about beautiful excess. Excessive explosions, excessive language, excessive titles. It had 12-year-old me committing crimes against humanity, torturing innocent people and making TikToks of my dead family. And I love it. I don't wanna die! Call of Duty Vanguard returns to its roots set in World War II, an era defined by black and white villains like Adolf Hitler, Joseph Stalin, and Charles the Fascist Cat, but it's been reimagined utilizing the hyper-realistic modern warfare engine, and goddamn does this game look good. Probably better than real life 1942, as color hadn't been invented yet, like gross. Ew, hideous. Aww. Vanguard has continued the age-old COD tradition of being divisive among fans with skill-based matchmaking, questionable map design, and development issues like being published by Activision. I didn't want my soul anyways, but I'm not here yeah, to yeah, talk yeah. that mad smack. That's your job. I'm here to summarize the Call of Duty Vanguard story with the budget of Call of Duty 1. So like $2, which means you know nothing. Not only is it gonna look and feel great, but it's gonna be silly, bro. I do it for the sexual thrill. And to get the true Call of Duty campaign experience of being a one-man army super soldier grenade oh. magnet, I played on the shameful yet liberating easy mode to focus on the narrative rather than the gameplay. This means I could blindly 360 enemies, soak up more bullets than Rasputin, and toss grenades like I'm Farvin 94. But when you're bad at video games, not even baby mode built for dogs can stop me from dying over and over and over again. The gameplay itself features staples of Call of Duty like sniper missions, stealth missions, car chases, civilian casualties, and looting dead corpses for essential supplies. That's my Pop-Tart, bitch. But with that being said, let's get right into our story, which opens in Hamburg, 1945, just as the Iron Curtain slowly oh, closes cool. on this violent German play called World World War II. We are playing as a tongueless protagonist named Novak, one member of Task Force Vanguard, a special operations crew made up of the world's best soldiers. We've got Arthur Kingsley and Richard Webb from England, expert sniper Polina Petrovna from Ukraine, Australian Lucas Riggs, American pilot Wade Jackson, and comic relief Randy, the homeless man from Detroit. I'm starving for attention. The goal of this mission is to retrieve important intel about a top secret Project Phoenix involving high ranking Nazi officials like Wehrmacht General Leo Steiner and the Desert Fox himself, Erwin Rommel, who was in fact an actual racist fox. It's an important task, but it's shrouded in mystery. The task force doesn't quite understand the why, but that's not a soldier's job. Soldiers kill first and ask questions later like, oh shit, I think we killed the wrong guy. Carl? And task force Vanguard's abilities like sniping, explosions, and suicide are immediately put on display with this covert intel recovery operation. We jump right into the action with a a train hijacking base infiltration James Bond mission filled with more drunk, aggressive Germans than Oktoberfest. So Novak, Arthur Kingsley, and Richard Webb aboard a submarine holding these secret files about Project Phoenix. That was surprisingly easy. They locate the documents but are unable to remove the lock because Randy forgot the lock cutters. Someone take that beer, but uh-oh. They are ambushed by the Nazis and their leader, Wendel Freisinger. That's a mouthful, and he is none too pleased about Task Force Vanguard snooping around his personal racist diary. And I get it. You never read another man's diary, especially when it's evil. Pathetic. But despite that whole Nazi business, this German seems like a halfway decent guy. I mean, he speaks English, he dresses quite suave, and he's so polite. Like he's even grabbing me a chair. That's not good. What the fuck, bro? 
So in the first mission of Call of Duty Vanguard, our speechless protagonist Novak is killed with chair warfare, the oldest kind, and now I'm speechless. This is called the Ned Stark effect. It really adds tangible stakes to our story moving forward as nobody feels safe. Anybody could be on the chopping block next like, oh shit, is Randy dead? <gasps> No, he's just drunk again. So our task force is transported by the Germans back to Berlin for further interrogation by Yannick Richter, a Gestapo underling, SS bureaucrat, and known Hobbit sympathizer. Arthur Kingsley, being the leader of the squad, is questioned first, which triggers our first PTSD flashback. No! D Day, 1944. Arthur Kingsley lands deep behind German lines. He has lost his gear, his gun, and is running through the woods naked and afraid. My worst nightmare. Arthur desperately needs to find his squad mates in the 6th Airborne, who he was separated from during his landing. So he goes full one man army on some blind German wankers. Seems kind of messed up, but when life gets you down, just bring others down with you. And and thank God Arthur is an optimist by nature, despite his English heritage, because things could always be worse. He could drown, he could be dumb, he could be that guy. Arthur, what's up? Bro? No, 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 no. Arthur locates his squad, but the captain is dead, and you know what that means. I'm the captain now. I'm calling the shots and I'm telling people what we are doing, where, when, and how. Attack these guys, push that cart, teabag that guy. I'm loving this. After licking their wounds and regrouping, Kingsley and Richard Webb are scoping out some German bunkers to capture so they can destroy their artillery. That's like $14 billion worth of vandalism, but it's worth it. Not only is vandalism <laughs> fun and cool, but these bunkers are a critical piece of land for the Allies to take the Normandy shores. And so Kingsley's division decide to bring out the big guns to assure success. Things like fireworks, binoculars, gas grenades, big guns, and of course the deadliest weapon of all, texting and driving. They capture the bunkers and narrowly avoid being bombed by the allied forces by sending up a flare shot that essentially signals, hey, please don't bomb me. And with that, our flashback ends and we come back to the present where SS officer Yannick Richter is being pressured to perform by his boss, the chair murderer, Ermin Freisinger. Not that kind of pressure. Freisinger needs to know what Task Force Vanguard knows about Project Phoenix. And so he threatens Richter with death and pain if he can't improve his quarterly torture performance benchmarks and get Task Force Vanguard to squeal. A classic up upper management move. Richter clearly has never tortured someone because it's really quite simple and elegant. You just grab their family members, nice, bro. vandalize their homes, and then you shoot them in the dick. It's a foolproof strategy. My dad's dick. So Richter gives up on interrogating Kingsley and moves on to Polina Petrovna, a Ukrainian sniper known as Lady Nightingale because of her deadly sniper shot, ability to climb and her pet bird. And this interrogation triggers our next PTSD flashback. Oh no! Somebody help me. Stalingrad, 1942. For the first time I'm ever, good. Call of Duty asks too much of me. Commit terrorism? Fine. Do math? Cool. Assassinate bald people? Gladly. But now, after all I've been through, betrayal, loss, epilepsy, you're gonna ask me to spend time with my family? How dare you? Can somebody pass the turkey? Our mission opens with a typical day in Russia. Paulina's brother Misha needs some Molotov cocktails from the local grocery store. It's a Russian staple next to the potatoes, vodka, and communist bread. It's delicious. Molotovs are great for pranking the neighbors and trolling the local library. Like, just get a Kindle, bro. So Paulina delivers the goods, does a little Assassin's Creed, and talk 
talks with the locals. Are you gonna fucking help me? When suddenly, the German Luftwaffe begin an air raid on Stalingrad. That can't be good. I'm a bomb. Paulina passes out because I'm that handsome, and when she awakens, the entire city is in shambles. The beautiful infrastructure, gone, the majestic music, silent, my really rude stepdad, dead. So it's not all bad, but this tragedy is really triggering me. So can we go back to a better memory, please? Yeah. And with that, we return to the present, where Wade Jackson, a lone wolf go-getter American pilot, actually wasn't captured by the Germans in Hamburg with a well-timed McDonald's run. And so Arthur Kingsley lies to Richter and claims Jackson is dead, but Richter sees through the farce and can smell the Mickey D farts from here. And so as punishment, he shoots Richard Webb right in the face for the crime he didn't commit. And because he's hideous. Not cool, Richter, but that's just good old school tough parenting. One kid lies, you shoot the other one. Uh, he ate the pancakes. What? Next, we follow Richter to another meeting with his boss, Freisinger, who informs him that Hitler is dead. Yahoo! But time is now of the essence. The Red Army is breathing down their necks, and so he gives Richter one last chance to make these vanguard piggies squeal to secure his getaway insurance or an accident may soon befall him. Oops. Maybe a bullet in the dick, perhaps a shove in the back, a slap on the butt, or possibly some scalding hot Mickey D's coffee will just magically appear on his desk. I'm loving it. And so now Richter is on the clock to perform, but he isn't the only party running out of time. Task Force Vanguard desperately needs to escape, and tensions between members are rising. Wade Jackson, the American survivor, is found and thrown in prison, and the other members no longer trust him because, bro, where were you? And don't say the bathroom, cause that's where Randy is. Wade proves his trustworthiness with a flashback that the other members can't see, but just don't think about it too much. The flashback shows Wade's transformation from lone wolf to team player, as he saves a crew of American soldiers in Japan, except that guy. Not Todd! So Wade earns the trust of the other Vanguard members by burning an entire rainforest and some Japanese samurai with a flamethrower. Fire beats steel, and you never bring a sword to a flamethrower fight. That's like Sun Tzu's third rule. This flashback keeps the gang all together, and since nostalgia is the best and most addictive drug, we're jumping immediately to another flashback. Stalingrad, 1943. Ukrainian sniper Polina and her Russian brethren are bitterly holding out against the German assault led by Wehrmacht General Leo Steiner, who has a tough task. I mean, not even Napoleon could beat the Russians in the snow. The brutal frostbite, the blinding white powder, the wild bears, the local cuisine. It's so cold that you won't even have a dick to shoot off because it'll shrivel up like a grape. I used to be a weenie. To survive these conditions, this Steiner guy must be one tough German cookie. Bonjour. A Christmas cookie. And for the holidays, Polina and her brother Misha are doing more typical Russian family activities, this time Russian snowball fighting, otherwise known as 1v1 sniper battles, a Christmas classic. Misha gets shot and sacrifices himself with a grenade to seal Polina's escape. Misha is now the Russian Jesus, which means it's time for some Catholic revenge. The Germans have taken everything from Polina, her father, her brother, the local Kroger. Somebody is gonna pay, and preferably, somebody innocent. Hey, do you guys know where the top So Polina goes on a revenge mission for Steiner. She works through his personal guard filled with snipers, 
Hunters, dogs, bears, and juggernauts. Oh my! Polina kills Steiner in an epic mannequin boss battle filled with Russian snowballs and Russian candy canes. Steiner reveals critical information about Freisinger and Project Phoenix, connecting it to other major German officials and hinting at its focus on taking the Third Reich underground. And this is the initial nudge that gets Polina involved with Task Force Vanguard, which is really just a curse. But fast forward to present day and Lucas Riggs, our Australian demolitions expert, is giving up his squad mates for protection. Disgusting. You never trust an Aussie. They're all convicts. But Riggs did help the Brits defeat the Germans in the Libyan desert, and for this reason, he was brought into the fold. It also doesn't hurt that he has a 99 accuracy rating in Madden, which allows him to toss death nuggets once again like Favre in 09, all while drunk on some dank Aussie liquor, otherwise known as kangaroo cum. Everyone knows alcohol, guns, and grenades make a great combination. I'm gonna do it. The flashback reveals specific high-ranking German officials involved with Project Phoenix, which leads back to present day in a fancy White Castle dinner with those very said officials. They toast to Hitler's death, and it quickly becomes clear that a subtle coup had formed as the German war effort became more and more grim. These members gave up on Germany and began plotting passage out of Berlin to a Caribbean club med to escape justice. But their confidence, despite their dire circumstances, Circumstances makes one wonder what information they have that we don't. We cut to Riggs and Richter discovering a pile of German soldiers that are dead. Uh, that's probably nothing. Richter and Riggs discuss the terms of Riggs' betrayal, but suddenly a Russian bomb hits the prison, giving Riggs the opening to overpower Richter and bring that sniveling hobbit back to the task force for revenge. It turns out Riggs' betrayal was all but a ruse meant to stall out Richter's investigation. A double cross. You see, you never trust an Aussie. Like, is anyone on this task force who they say they are? Is Arthur really English? Is Paulina really a nightingale? Is Randy even homeless? Richter is taken to the task force to be interrogated. How the tables have turned, but Richter really doesn't know much. Freisinger has kept him in the dark with only Hansel and Gretel breadcrumbs to guide him forward. And as the task force is about to kill Richter, he has an epiphany and finally puts the puzzle pieces together. The dead bodies, Freisinger trash-talking Hitler, the White Castle, Richter realizes Project Phoenix was essentially a backup plan to allow specific traders to escape and create a fourth Reich elsewhere. Hence Phoenix. Phoenix's rise from the ashes, stronger and more beautiful than before, Except this phoenix is a fascist, so let's kill it. Richter is killed for his past sins, and the task force looks to head off Freisinger, who is launching his escape. But they are still pretty angry about him wasting a perfectly good chair, and so they pursue him. The task force battles through a war-torn Berlin as the Russians completely obliterate the city, turning it into a beautiful yet dreadful cacophony of flame, gunfire, and bread. Task force Vanguard track down Freisinger, who cryptically reveals potential cooperation cooperation with the Allies as he hints at a new life in America. Good luck with that, but he's clearly never met me because I'll do anything to win. Cock shots, butt shots, and my favorite fireball shots. Freisinger gets torched into a campfire and Task Force Vanguard hop into his private jet for some dank Instagram pics where they discover a gold mine of Nazi information. Operation Revive the Dead, Literal Gold, Project AA for Randy, and they all fly off under the cover of war to bigger and brighter things. Oh shit! That's the video. Get the hell out of here. Go. Don't click on this. Don't click on this video right here.